Thanks, guys. I used to be a dragon, but I think I'm much nicer now. Well, I leave you to judge. So we're going to go on a bit of a journey, and there's just me and you and our collective brains today. So I need to get your brains moving as much as mine is going to. So first of all, I want you to do something really easy. You're hardwired to do it. Stretch your brain back to your early memories. Not your earliest. Well, if you can do your earliest, do. My earliest memory is making a daisy chain in the Phoenix Park where I grew up. I know it was my earliest memory because my father came and collected me and my sisters and he told us that a new baby had arrived in the house. So often our earliest memories are the ones where we remember an event. Now stretch your brain. You've probably forgotten how to do it. It's not dangerous. Obviously don't try unnecessary journeys or anything when you're doing it. <laughs> Okay, now, come back into the room and catapult your brain way off into the future. When you were growing up, Anne, Siobhan, Joan, Mary, John, what did you want to be? What was your unfulfilled potential? Was it that you wanted to have a PhD? Did you want to cross the finishing line of a marathon? Did you want to own your own business? Did you want to play in a rock band? Did you want to climb Everest or Kilimanjaro or Karen Toole? Imagine that. What's your unfulfilled potential? Keep it in your head. Keep your brain in the future. Imagine crossing the finishing line, just picking up Dr. Casey, your PhD, I assume. Imagine that moment, because now, You've just done something quite extraordinary. It's a hidden superpower that you possess. It's quite amazing, and it's the nub of the secret I'm going to tell you today. But your brain has to be open to getting the secret. So now I need you to do some mental time travel with me. It's not to the happiest day of my life. It's not even to my earliest memory. It's to the worst day of my life. I'm not going to embellish it. All of you know me. You know I'm not afraid to talk about grief. You know that. I made a documentary, Tough Gig, Thursday night, 9.30, trying to get people to tune in, to look at me, talking to Gabriel Byrne and others about death and dying, a privilege to talk to people who faced their own demise. I wrote a book on the subject. I've talked about it. I've cried on national television. But today, I don't have to do that. Okay, so you're just going to have to leave me off. Because there are some days that we only ever want to experience once, and I've experienced that day time and time again, so I'm not going to do it today. But suffice to say, because it's so important to what I want to tell you, is that the worst day of my life was the day my lovely, beautiful, vibrant husband Richard died a few years ago. Now, we all get our S-H-I-T in life. Every single one of you. Every single one of you has lost somebody you loved. I lost my father, good friends. In fact, my sister died a few months before Richard did. I'm no stranger to grief, and you're not. If you haven't had grief, it's going to get you. If you haven't had adversity, it's going to get you. So the question in your life is not, will you fall down? What will you do when you fall down? Okay, I have the cure. It took me a while, but I have the cure. So imagine this, a few days after Richard died, I did what I was hardwired to do. I was a dragon, an investor, a businesswoman. I got up, I dusted myself down, and I said to Dara, my lovely, beautiful 12-year-old, who's quite broken and grief-stricken, do you know what we're going to do? We're just going to dust ourselves down, we're going to get into that car, and you're going to go to school, and I'm going to go to work. Afterwards, when I spoke on Ryan Tubbity and, and the Saturday Night Show about this, people on social media called me a hard-hearted bitch for doing that. I wasn't a hard-hearted bitch. I was a widow who didn't know what to do. So... Dutifully, no matter how bad the days were, and they were bad, no matter how bad the nights were, we got up and we got in that car and we drove to school and work. And as the months went by, I worried, because I'm a homework geek and I've used evidence and learning the whole of my life, I worried that I wasn't doing it right. I wasn't doing this grieving thing because it still felt pretty terrible. So I started poring over the books that friends had given me and the websites, and I found these stages of grief. Oh my God, those stages of grief. And Dara would come crashing in some nights from school, and he'd say, what are you doing? And I'd say, I'm looking at the stages of grief, and he'd say, where am I at, Mom? I said, I'm not sure. <laughs> are you at acceptance? Yeah, I think I know he's dead. Okay, how about anger? Ah, oh, Jesus, Mom, I'm not angry that he died. I just feel pretty terrible. I said, I feel pretty terrible too. So a couple of nights later, he came in. He said, you've got those stages up again. I said, he says, I know where I'm at. I said, great. Where are you at? He said, I'm at denial. I said, my God, my brilliant 12-year-old has got some flashing, blinding light of genius about his bereavement and his grief. He said, yeah, I'm at denial and I can see the pyramids, Mum. <laughs> you have to be Irish to get that joke. I was fed up feeling guilty that I wasn't going through those stages of grief. They're a load of rubbish. Forget them. Nobody goes through those stages of grief. So I started doing what I'm hardwired to do, is looking for evidence. The next day, I sat on my computer and into Google I wrote, the cure for grief is dot, dot, dot. Up came the most amazing quote. This man, Albert Hubbard is his name, he died over 100 years ago off the coast of Old Kinsale. And he died because a German U-boat torpedoed the Lusitania and himself and his wife passed away. He called himself an anarchist and an author. And he wrote, the cure for grief, wait for it, is motion. 
The cure for grief is motion. This man didn't even know how genius that was. The cure for grief is motion. I knew that was important to me because I had none. I was sitting on the coach, couch every single night. I was binge watching Netflix. I was lunging for a glass of wine. I was eating every carb I could get my hands on. There was no emotional state I wasn't going to eat my way through. There was no motion going on in my life. And I'll tell you why. Because during those months when Richard was sick, during those months, I stayed in the moment, not a natural state for me. I studied strategy and business. I've always looked at the future. I stayed in the moment because that's how I coped. I stayed in the moment because talking about coffee and tea and milk and getting the wheelchair out of the car and what time is the doctor's appointment and what's the weather going to be like today was far better. And if my mind at any point flew off into that terrible, terrible scenario of a future where he was going to leave me and die with a will of iron, I grabbed it back to the present. And I said, will it be sugar today? Would you like tomato soup for your lunch? I stayed in the moment, and when he died, I was stuck in the moment. Worse, not just stuck in the moment. The incredible allure of the past had gripped me. I found my sanctuary was back in those wonderful, wonderful moments where I was building a life and a future with Richard. In my head, when the business of the day would ebb, what did I do? I went back over holidays, beautiful days, the day I married him, the day was Darrow was born, the day we decided to buy the business Harmonia, the day he laughed when I said, I'm out in Dragon's Den. All of those things were just beautiful places for me to be. There was no motion going on in my life. I was going backwards. So, the cure for grief is motion. I read over 100 pieces of research. I did all the hard work so you don't have to. I counted it the other day, 100 pieces of research. Came across this amazing man. I'm in love with him. I'm in love with big brains. I never met him. Big brains are far better than George Clooney, sorry. Thomas Suddendorf is his name. He's an Australian anthropologist. He's a genius. He spent two decades of his life, so I wouldn't have to, looking at what makes us uniquely human. Go back to Charles Darwin, the origin of the species. Charles Darwin believed that like our nearest relatives, the chimpanzees, who are the closest to us, and by the way, we are the closest to chimpanzees than any other animal in the species, and like our more distant relatives, the orangutans and the gorillas, we all share a common foundation. We may have higher traits, we may be more highly evolved, but Thomas Suddendorf and other scientists believed that actually there must be something uniquely human about us. There must be something that sets us apart from the rest of the animal kingdom that means we now rule the planet, so much so that we're nearly exterminating our nearest relatives. What's uniquely human about us? Two things. One you won't be surprised at. Uniquely human, the only species on the planet that can do it. We are obsessed with communicating with each other. We're obsessed with a deep-seated, hardwired drive to need to swap story and share experiences. It doesn't take much to know that we've just had an entire generation spending the best brains, not curing cancer, but finding ways we can swap stories and share experiences, virtually and digitally, in photographs, Snapchats, tweets, and more else besides. The second thing, far more importantly in terms of the cure for grief, what you did earlier. Do you know how magical that is? You are the only species who can do it. You can put your brain into the past, not just to your earliest living memory. You can go back in your brain to the dawn of civilization, to Stephen Hawkins, to the Big Bang, and you can collect all those memories and experiences and bring them into the present and use them. Better still, here's the genius bit. You can predict future scenarios. No other species on the planet can do it. You can say, I want to own that business. I want the PhD. I'm going to marry that man. I'm going to have that baby. I'm going to live in that house. I'm going to go to the Caribbean and lie on a sun-drenched beach. And here's the really, really cool bit. You can then decide which one you're going to do using free will. You can set a course for your brain on a journey towards that destination. Why was that important to me? Because I didn't have a destination. Imagine this, I'm in a car. Richard, the car is going to feature today. I don't know why, sometimes it's a car, sometimes it's something else. Richard and I are on a journey. We're sitting in the front seat together. Don't know who's driving, probably him. There's in the back seat, a big bloody boulder just fell on the road right in front of me, destroyed the path and the road. There was no longer one. And I wasn't so much in the slow lane, I was crashed on the curb. I was crashed on the curb with no petrol, no gas, no ignition, no future. Because when he died, my future died with him. So I knew, number one cure, I had to find a future. Now, you have to remember, there's a bit of me that wanted to turn that ignition on. You have to remember that I was this person, monosyllabic line on a couch. I had no notion of turning on that ignition. I had no interest in putting petrol in that car, even though I knew I had to find a future. Second cure for grief. I found that trigger and I found it by accident. So, 
picture this. A few months after Richard died, probably about eight, my mom, who's a counsellor, she's great, she said, you know what, you just haven't accepted things, stages of grief. So you need to go off into the countryside and spend some time together with Dara and go and walk in the woods and doing all those lovely things, and your mind will come to terms with this cataclysmic event. So there I am, me and my mind. Not good company for each other, I can tell you. Out of the blue, I got a call from a producer, and she said, listen, here's the thing. Uh, this famous news presenter, you all know him, Vincent Brown. He's going on holiday. Yes, he does take some. Would you fill in for him? Half mad at grief, desperate to escape the mountains and the Wicklow Hills. I said, do you know what? I'll do it. Yeah, no bother. I'll, I'll fill in for him. So I drove up to TV3, and I will not use that expletive that I use. Let's suffice to say that I pulled the car up, looked at the sign, and said, what the hell are you doing? Unbelievably. I had just spent eight months locking myself in the boardroom, not speaking to anybody, apart from somebody saying sorry for your troubles and times a great healer, which it isn't, by the way. That's all the conversation I'd had, and here I was going to host a news and current affairs program, fast moving. So I walked in the door, and the producer said, how are you doing? Nora said, I'm doing great. I went to the bathroom and threw up. She brought me into the boardroom. She said, see all this research? It's on fiscal stuff today. The Minister for Finance is on, loads of economists. That's all the research. You have a few hours to get that into your head. Now, I pride myself. I'm a journalist. I have good short-term memory. I think I can regurgitate stuff for a period of time. Not a synopsis going on in my brain. I read every sentence 50,000 times while she comes in every now and again and says, how are you doing? Great. Into the bathroom. I was in that bathroom more often than I was in the boardroom. So by the time I was sitting in the chair, oh my God, I looked at the Minister for Finance. I couldn't even remember his name. I had this red rash which started here on my chest, which was flaming up my neck and up into my cheeks. There was a big ball in my throat. I had no saliva. The autocue was just a blur. There wasn't a question in my head. Oh my God, I nearly bolted from my seat. And that wouldn't be the first time somebody bolted from a Vincent Brown show. But it's not usually the presenter. <laughs> first time for everything. As the autocue started to move, as the camera started to roll, I don't know what happened. My breathing steadied, I got stuck into it. And before I knew it, somebody's in my ear saying it's a minute to wrap. And I'm turning around saying, hi, it's Nora Casey, and tune in tomorrow night. On the way home, I called my mother. I don't know why, but when I'm afraid, and I'm in the car, and I'm worried about being carjacked, she's 80-something, and she lives miles away, but I always call her. So I said, Mags, 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 did you hear what he said? And did you see that tweet and that ridiculous question from the man? And she's going, oh my God, Nora, I have never heard you talk like this for at least a year. You're on fire. So I realized something really important, really important. My brain was moving. I found an ignition. I found a, scar a spark. Do you know what it's called? It's called dopamine. I'm not going to get all geeky and technical on you, but you know, I'm a guru on dopamine. I've read everything there is to know, myths, misconceptions, everything else. Do you know what drives people on, explorers and adventurers? What makes them walk those 22 days to the North Pole? Not adrenaline. Adrenaline holds you back. It's dopamine. What makes you go into the jungle when others would run in the opposite direction? National Geographic did this amazing article which talked about entrepreneurs, explorers, adventurers, and how their brains were coursing with dopamine. This was very important to me because then I became slightly addicted to that dopamine fix because that gasoline in my car, that dopamine, at its worst, when dopamine is free-flowing, it has no brakes, it puts you into the fast lane, it careers you down destructive paths. So people who are addicted to drugs and alcohol and gambling and smoking, it's because of dopamine. So at its best, it encourages to do new things, like I had done, face abject terror, take risks. You get your dopamine flowing. Why is this important to grief? Because when you meet the person you love, and I hope some of you in the room have already, and your eyes lock across a crowded room, it's nothing to do with this heart, okay? I was a nurse. This just pumps blood around your body 100,000 times a day. Entirely to do with up here, your brain, okay? It's up here in your brain. So when you meet somebody you love, dopamine gets released and you are the best you can possibly be. You're witty, you're smiling, you're charming. You can usually write poetry, you can sing music, you can actually run faster, you can stay up all night doing God knows what, but the next day you have a bounce in your step. People talk about you being lit up from inside. It's addictive. Being in love is about dopamine. And then when you stay in love and you have that bond, that other person gives you your dopamine fuel. So all day, every day, when you have pimples and greasy hair and you wake up and he says, you look gorgeous, darling. When he gives you a kiss, when he affirms everything you do, that dopamine has been fueled. So when you break up with somebody, or worse, when they die, it is the equivalent of going cold turkey on hard drugs. Your dopamine goes through the floor. And the worst thing about dopamine is when it's absent, it's virtually impossible to get it back. And here I was, by pure accident, I found that this bit of my brain, searching for the dopamine in my lost life with Richard, was being replaced with a dopamine fix on this side. And I went on to do Vincent Brown the next day. Of course, I hosted News Talk, got up at 4 a.m. for a year and a half, did 13 episodes of The Takeover, wrote a book, did the afternoon show. The comedian started saying, there's loads of jobs in Ireland. It's just Nora Casey has them all. 
everyone said, you're running from it. I wasn't running from it, I was running towards it. It was fantastic. I was on fire for the first time since Richard died, and I had devised a future for the first time. So here I am in my car. I now have the gasoline, and I've got the future. There's a third magic ingredient in the cure for grief. The third one, if I was to pile up next to me, all of the research reports, all of the papers, all of the books I've written, and I've read on grief and on the brain and the power of the brain, be miles high. Equally, if I asked every single person who pushed that car when I didn't want them to, who took over the steering wheel when I didn't want to drive myself, who cheered me from the hard shoulder, sitting beside me, sitting behind me, if I said to them, would you like to come on stage, they would fill this whole theatre. Because the second cure for grief is that other insatiable need that we have to share stories, swap experiences, and collectively learn together. So here's what all the geeks and the scientists say, a very important thing really important. Imagine your mind like a sat-nav. You can put the destination in. So I already, first cure for grief, I knew I had to have a destination. You can find the trigger and the ignition, and you can find the momentum in all the wonderful people in your life. But actually, you are far better off asking somebody who's been there. Because when you put that destination in your sat-nav, it only simulates the journey. Your mind only knows what you've given it up to that point in your life. And if you've never been in that place, the more scientific and rational thing to do is ask somebody who's in the place that you want to be how they got to be there. Now, for me, I had an amazing, amazing, titanic woman in my life called Mags Casey. And she said, there are some things that mothers should never have to pass on to their daughters, but I am eternally grateful that she did. So if you are ever crashed on that curbside the same way I was, and you want to be where I am now, I've just told you how I got there. Thank you for listening to me.